Uh, Well, friends, please turn with me to Psalm 74. Uh, I tell you, one of the things to love about the Bible is its realism. Uh, You won't find that the Bible pretends uh, things in this world are better than they actually are. Uh, It doesn't cover up the sins of um, big, important men. It doesn't trick us into thinking that following Jesus is easier than it is. Uh, It doesn't pretend that there are not real uh, evils in this world and long-suffering for the people of God. Uh, And that's worth knowing, I reckon. When you come to Jesus, you know that you're not coming to one who's going to pretend with you. You're not coming to a a health, wealth and prosperity gospel preacher. And uh, there's certainly no pretending when you come to Psalm 74. Uh, It's a psalm in which uh, God's people have been, at this stage, utterly destroyed uh, by the enemies of God. Uh, Everything's lost. They are in uh, deep, deep grief and they're calling out to the Lord and it feels like the Lord doesn't hear and it feels like the situation that they're in will just never, ever end. And it's worth, as we look at this psalm today, seeing um, two sections in particular. There's three sections in the psalm, but we'll focus on two um, this morning. And the first one, I think, is this. Um, it comes in the way of a question. Uh, won't, you, won't you grieve over a ruined church? I'll have a look at verse 1. O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Now, the psalmist Asaph is uh, t- talking about 587 BC. Uh, it's a date, I think, that was burnt in the minds of Every, every Jew at the time. Uh, it's the date that marks the utter destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, uh, the exile of uh, so many of the people of God to Babylon. As uh, the Babylonian army uh, marches in and destroys pretty much everything. And the, and the writer, uh, he remembers that, that day and he feels the weight of the destruction and the grief deeply. Uh, he knows it comes from the hand of God. Second part of verse 1. Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? He knows who they are. We are your sheep, he says. We are your congregation, your assembly. Purchased, redeemed out of slavery in Egypt. We are Mount Zion where you dwelt. How, how is it possible that God's enemies have come and, they, and they've totally destroyed everything? and Nothing's left. Now, uh, let's be a little clear at this point. I, do, I don't think he is asking particularly why this has happened. God has actually told his people through the prophets already. He said, "Reject the rejection of him and the rebellion against him would result in this very thing happening. Obadiah, Joel, Zephaniah, Isaiah, Jeremiah and others have told them over and over and over again that this was coming if they continued in their ungodliness. I think they knew why, but I think their question's more along the lines of, how long? Will you be angry against us forever, God? Will there be ever a time again when the Lord will have mercy on his people? Will the Lord's salvation be ever seen again in the whole of the world, or is it all gone forever? Lost forever. 
And you feel, you feel this pain, I think, as, as you read it. Um, are, these, are not, these are not God-hating people. These are not people who are questioning God's existence. They're servants of the living God who have seen God's assembly, God's congregation, completely destroyed, and they, and they grieve. I'm not sure... How far, I'm not sure how far away this psalm is from, from the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, it may well have been some years. But it seems to me that the writer is old enough uh, to have been there and to have witnessed it himself. And uh, that terrible day when the siege of, of Jerusalem ended. And, uh, I mean, you can see, you see what he says in verse 3. He says... To God, direct your steps. Come, come and have a look at all that's happening. Walk with me through the ruins. The enemy has destroyed it all. There's nothing left. And uh, he describes it very vividly. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They've set up their own signs. You look around. Gods and godlets of the Babylonians and And symbols of their might and their strength and the strength of their army is everywhere. You look and you look around the congregation and there are all of the little godlets. And all of the signs of the God of Israel and his covenant with his people have all been removed. It's like these Babylonian soldiers have come in swinging their axe through the forest, destroying all that is beautiful Come into the most beautiful place where all of the signs of the goodness and the mercy and the kindness and the strength and the power of the living God have all been broken down as they march on through with axe and the congregation is destroyed. And there's no fear of God in their minds. Walking into a church and hearing liberal theology preached from the pulpit. Walking into a church and seeing great flags of colours of the rainbow. and We fully support the LGBTQ community. Walking into a church... past place where they sell trinkets and all the things that should be there have been taken out and all the things that shouldn't be there have been put in place and all the beauty has been removed and all that is ugly has been put in place and the congregation's destroyed and there's no fear of God in the minds and the hearts of the Babylonians verse 7 they set They set your sanctuary on fire. The very place where they met with the living God. They set it on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name. Bringing it down to the ground. And perhaps worst of all, uh, there's no word from God. And no prophet speaks anymore. No one can speak words of the Lord to troubled people's hearts. Verse 11, why do you hold back your hand? Your right hand, take it from the folds of your garment and destroy them. Why, Lord? Why? Why so long? Grab your sword. Protect your name. Do you feel his lament? Asif asks, how long? Won't you act, God? Now he knows. He knows they're not perfect. He knows the sins of the past. But will there ever be mercy for God's people ever again? That's what he's asking. Will there ever be a place on the earth anywhere where God's people can meet with the living God and hear his voice again? Will there ever be a place on earth that displays God's goodness and his greatness and his power? Will there ever be a place like that on the earth again? Or is it all lost forever? Has God's plan for salvation failed don't you wonder? Don't you wonder sometimes when you look around and you see you see such animosity against the living God, such power, and it seems to rule. 
Why is it that North Korea and its evil leader allow, is allowed to destroy churches and uh, Christians and nothing seems to happen? Why doesn't he drop dead? How long will God keep bad leaders in churches who destroy all that's good? And, and they're often the biggest churches with wicked leaders who promote themselves and know nothing of the gospel of grace. Why doesn't God walk in and deal with it? Why are there church members who destroy churches from the inside? What is so beautiful. Churches that display the beauty of Christ and yet they come in like people with axes. And they whinge and complain and draw people to themselves and destroy a church from the inside. The very people who should be delighting in the Lord. And the very, very people that, where there ought to be unity, there's disunity. What are so many bad laws passed through our parliaments that slowly push churches and Christianity and Christians out of our culture? Slowly but surely. It's right to be sad, isn't it? When you see God's congregation in ruins, when we see ungodliness where there ought to be holiness, when we see false teaching in pulpits where there ought to be truth, when we see division in church life where there ought to be beautiful unity in the gospel. Doesn't it grieve you when you see that? And I think part, I think at least part of this psalm is to help us to grieve where we ought to grieve. When you see God's name mocked, when we see God's church in ruins, there is something really precious, truly precious that's been destroyed. And I think it's right to be sad. And the psalmist is sad, goes singing with him are sad, sad at the state of churches full of liberal theology, sad the destruction of God's congregation. Here, I mean, here's the place where you see the glory of Jesus. There would be great grief if this place was destroyed. Well, that's the first thing. Why don't you grieve over a ruined church? I think most of the rest of the psalm is taken up with the thought of, well, if that's the case, where can you stand that solid ground? In the weeping, where can you stand that solid ground? Uh, and it's at this point the writer sort of emphasises this, I think, um, by, by his change in tone. Um, he speaks about two places where, that you can stand with certainty. Uh, verse, verse 12. Uh, and remember this is the song, okay? It's to, be, it's to be sung. And up until now, the congregation has been singing together. And now we hit verse 12, one voice is singing and so he's emphasising this verse by just one voice reaching out from all of the others. Everyone else gone silent. One voice. Yet God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. I think it's, I think it's the key to the whole of the psalm. God is my King and he brings salvation. The God we belong to rules and rescues. And then the writer illustrates that in, uh, in two poetic ways. Um, poetry is not my strong point. Um, boys and girls, um, here's a poem I found that I thought Dudley might like. This is about the level of my poet, poetry um, appreciation. Listening, boys and girls? All doggies go to heaven, uh, or so I've been told. They run and play along the streets of gold. Why is heaven such a doggy delight? Why? Because there's not a single cat in sight. <laughs> I'm not sure how truthful that poem is, um, but I appreciated it, which maybe shows you something about my poetry appreciation. The next part is poetry, and 
I'm hoping I can explain it without butchering the nature. For the Jew is in their thinking is the place of chaos and darkness and evil. natural forces of nature being the lower forces of nature and the things that we can see. And you might see the outworking of that of, of Satan in in concrete things like the malice and the violence of the Babylonian soldiers. But behind them stands the the evil one himself, the monster of monsters. Satan himself, who is wicked and evil and hates Christ. There's a sense in which uh, the psalmist is saying, the problem's a bit bigger than you think. The problem's not just the Babylonian army. There are monsters at work in our world and in our church. There are supernatural forces of evil that bring such disorder and trample upon the moral order of God. 
going, swinging their axes to destroy the people of God, bringing disorder and destruction from the inside and from the outside. Western culture, ruled in a sense by the devil himself, hostile to the people of God. The bigger, don't just look at the Babylonian soldiers, something even bigger behind it. Behind Babylon itself is Satan. It's like he's saying, take a step back and see something bigger. I remember um, 20 years ago when I first came back here to to work as a pastor, um, a lady in the congregation, still in the congregation here, she she told me, um, you know, the devil will do whatever he can to stop you coming to church. Now, she might have said, um, wanting to sleep in will seek to stop you coming to church. She might have said, the cold weather of Tamworth, and I know everyone in Armidale laughs, but the cold weather of Tamworth might stop you coming to church. And she would be right. She took a step back and she said, behind those things, Satan hates you coming to church and he'll do everything to stop you including making you tired and the weather cold. And uh, there's uh, the reason I remember it 20 years later is because it was sobering. There's sobering words. The psalm's sobering in that way. One level, our, our culture seeks to remove churches. But step back from that and you'll see Satan himself working and moving in our culture to bring the destruction. Churches everywhere. One level, our culture is... One level, um, disunity here will destroy your church. I mean, that's sobering, isn't it? It's a big deal to hate a brother and sister in Christ here. The big deal to not rectify a relationship. We just think it's nothing sometimes. No, it's serious. I don't think that will destroy a church. Step back from that. And you see the devil himself who loves, who loves it, undermining and destroying a church from the inside. And that's really what's happening there with the, in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Selling their land giving just part of the money to the church, but saying we gave it all. We're so generous. Look at us. We're so wonderful. Promoting themselves. Making themselves good by lying. I think that'll destroy a church. People more concerned about themselves and about the glory of Jesus. I think that won't destroy this church. And uh, Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart? And you see how serious Jesus takes it as they both drop dead. I don't think Satan is at work in those things. We brush them off. Oh, well, unity or disunity in church, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter? Who are you kidding? (laughs) It doesn't matter? I tell you, it's sobering, isn't it? Think your church can't be destroyed. Think Think this church is a fragile Unity is fragile. Think, the, think all the attacks come from the outside? When well, there's some big attacks from the outside, I tell you, they come from the inside just as much. But here's the thing. The psalmist says, take another step back. Take a step back and see Satan. And he says, now take another step back. See the really big picture. We belong to the king who is king over Satan. And the evil that he does. He parts the sea and he kills the sea monster. Friends, when all around us is evil and destruction, and there are lots of things to know, but perhaps fundamental is that the Jesus we belong to is king over evil as well. When, uh, you know, when Jesus was on earth, 
and he tells the demons what to do and they obey him. It's not a small thing. It wasn't an incidental thing. He wants you to see with great clarity that he commands the demons. When uh, Babylonians destroy God's congregation, they are as much servants of Jesus, even though they don't know it, as you or I. If it was their plans to flex their muscles and take over the world, it was their plan because first it was God's plan. And with all the cruel and murderous ways that you see, are they all under the hand of the living God who is king? Yes, they are. Along with ISIS and the Taliban and Hamas and all the other evils that you can think of. And uh, it's not, not like Jesus is trying to make something good out of all the evil that happens in our history. He's Lord of history. He's running the history. Whether in the sins and the evil, or whether in the godliness of men and women, the Lord runs history and brings about his purposes. Can you get your head around that one? Uh, Jesus is just so big. And it's hard to get your head around it all, and I get that. But the Jesus we belong to rules evil as much as he rules what is good. When evil crowds in, there's a place you can stand, knowing that Jesus is making no mistakes. That's where you, that's where you stand. There's one place. Jesus is king. Here's the second place. And it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit strange the way he says it. A little bit of assumed knowledge. He, he says, verse 16, Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heaven, heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Now, I'm not sure that you would get those two verses unless you happen to have been reading the prophet Jeremiah. Guess who these people would have been reading constantly the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, you ever heard the phrase, um, beyond a shadow of doubt? Or, is the Pope Catholic? Or, uh, as sure as night follows day? All those ways of saying certainty. Um, if God is king, how do I know he will work salvation? Here's what Jeremiah says. Thus says the Lord, if if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night will not come as at, at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, will be broken so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. In other words, Jeremiah is saying, the Lord has said to him, as sure as night follows day, King David will have his King, King David, the, the King of King David will be on the throne. As sure as night follows day, I would have to break my covenant with the night and the day for that not to happen. And I'm not about to do that. As sure as night follows day, Jesus the King will come. There's a place you can stand. Just, just because I don't, I don't understand what God is doing doesn't mean that he doesn't know what he's doing. And in his great goodness, there is a perfect reason to do it all. And in every part of it, he is intentionally doing exactly what he means to do. And even if I don't understand the precise reasons for it all, I know with absolute certainty Jesus is king and his salvation will never fail. He will rescue his people and that is as certain as night following day. When the Babylonians came and knocked down Jerusalem, I think it looked like the end of everything. Their plan was to obliterate the nation and they took the best minds out of Babylon to assimilate them into their culture. 
And uh, so that all the Jewish distinctiveness would be gone and the, the scriptures would be gone. And if you know the story, you know Daniel and his friends made a stand in Babylon by the, by the, by the mercy of God. And there, true Judaism um, remained and was protected along with the word of God, who, the Lord who protects his word preserves it so that out of them eventually the Messiah would come. Not, not in spite of all the evil that happened, but because of it. And it all looks crazy sometimes and uh, the psalmist felt the pain and maybe wondered at the pointless nature of it, but it wasn't pointless. It was all wonderfully intentional in really, really big ways that they didn't ever see in their time. That's where you can stand when the enemy comes. I, um, Esther and I went to Western Australia last year and uh, there was this large, large section of, of boggy ground. And the only way to get across this boggy ground was to jump from, you know those great tufts of grass, huge things, like a metre high and sort of a metre round and you can jump onto them and it can be boggy everywhere else but where these tufts are and you can jump from one to another to another and remain unmuddied. Um, it, it's like the psalmist is setting up those and he says here is where you can stand and not drown in the swamp of confusion or the swamp of despair or the swamp of concern that the Lord God doesn't know what he's doing. He says, no, no, no. Where's dry ground that is safe? The Lord that you belong to. Jesus is king. Be absolutely certain. And he works his salvation for his people. Sometimes that can be really, really mysterious. But it is as certain as night follows day. It's true. When you know that, you can sleep at night when you see destruction in churches, and you know that, you know that you can be patient and wait for Jesus to bring about the things that he wants to bring about in his own good time. I think that's where the psalm ends, and this is where the sermon ends, so don't panic, there's not another 20 minutes or anything. But he finishes, I think, standing there and waiting. He says, have regard for the covenant. For the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause in your time. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. Do not forget the clamours of your foes, the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. As I stand here, and I wait God's good timing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you tell us that not even the gates of hell will, will have victory against your churches. For Lord, you will protect your people. For you are king of the realm of evil. You are king over Satan, though he hates it. For you are king of everyone and everything and you work salvation and your salvation is as secure as night following day. Lord, we thank you that we belong to a Jesus who is that big and that wonderful. We don't need to understand everything. We just need to trust him and be patient knowing that day is coming when every knee will, da- will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Give us patience as we wait for that day, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, 